Sometimes you just need to read a book with 18 characters who all have the same name. It's like Die Hard, except it's in space. And it's also better than Die Hard. When your parents think you have a brain tumor, but you really just have the force. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. It is Emma. Um, I'm here to do my May wrap-up. I'm not going to go in order this time. I'm actually going to split this wrap-up kind of thematically. We're going to start with some of my favorite books of the month. My favorite book of the month, and one of my favorite books of all time now, uh, came in the form of 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I cannot tell you guys how much I just fell in love with this book um, and how crazy I feel about this book. I have a lot of reading vlogs where I talk about this book for a pretty good amount of time because I just, I can't tell you how much I feel for this book and how much now holding it again and seeing everything that I felt about it, how much I literally want to just reread it right now and start reading it. So 100 Years of Solitude is a Colombian classic written in 1967 by Marquez. It is a work of magical realism in which we are following this one family, the Buendia family, and let me show you them. Here they all are! <laughs> Kind of. Almost all of them, I think. Um, if you can't tell, they all have basically the same names circulating throughout um, their family lineage. That is what we're following throughout the book. Their trials, tribulations, tragedies, mistakes, rotating tropes and uh, events that keep happening on this very circular path uh, that they cannot break away from while they're living in the mythical town of Mokondo. Alright, I had to take a little brain injury break, but we're back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the way this book deals with, like, literally every single thing ever, um, and themes, and people, and places, and time, was insane. Another thing I really need to talk about for a little bit, at least, is Marquez's writing, because so powerful, so beautiful. This was a book whose every single sentence, almost, I wanted to tap, which was just, it was insane, absolutely insane. Um, every single sentence was like fixated about something um, and about something that would reappear later obviously there's so many motifs and versions on a theme if you will that this book takes on and plays with throughout the whole book this book deals with so many political issues in colombia outside of colombia colonialism post-colonialism it was just so important and so brimming with so much pain and history. There are so many historical events that are worked into here and then kind of played around with magical realism. Oh my gosh, you guys, this was just an amazing book. I cannot tell you. Um, wow. I wish we had studied this at university. I wish, I hope, sometime in my future we get to look at this in an academic setting because um, one, of, one of the best books I've ever read, honestly. So this is my favorite book of the month and um, yeah, I feel so not up to the task of talking about this book as um, eloquently or as movingly as I would like to be apt to do, but all I can say is to read it. I didn't even say my rating, but I gave it five stars. Another favorite book of mine this month came in the form of When We Were Orphans by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, this is crazy. This is so crazy as well. These books just like, they take you on such a wild ride. They're so different. They're just not mainstream ways of storytelling or telling stories or reconstructing a narrative or constructing a narrative at all. Um, but When We Were Orphans specifically and 100 Years of Solitude, they do reconstruct historical events. When We Were Orphans plays around with the second Sino-Japanese War. It uses that as one of its kind of terrains and landscapes of the novel. But the main landscape of When We Were Orphans by Ishiguro is memory. That is like his playground. His... maybe playground is not the right word. I think a better word might be just like a canvas that is forever changing, forever being written over, repainted over, just like the palimpsest of the human mind and the way that Ishiguro plays around with it. Um, crazy. Absolutely insane. The experience of reading when we were orphans, um, <laughs> it was just crazy. It was so crazy. Oh my gosh. I gave this four stars, maybe four and a half now that I'm rambling on about it and thinking more about it. Uh, it's my first Ishiguro book. I would love to get more into his works because this was mind-blowing. When We Were Orphans begins very quietly with our main character, Christopher Banks, kind of telling us in the style of a detective novel about his uh, buying of a home in England because he grew up and was born in Shanghai with his parents. Um, and then one day his parents disappeared uh, and were abducted. 
and are missing. There is a hole where his parents used to be. So he is shipped off to London to live with his aunt, um, and he is obsessed with Sherlock Holmes and all these famous detectives of his day. Uh, it's also set in the 1930s. So obviously not of his day, but you know what I mean. Um, and he grows up just like wanting to be this famous detective, obviously very highly influenced by the case of his parents that has ne that has never been solved. So he is now a grown man telling us his story. Um, it's very interesting because Ishiguro will begin a scene and like his method and style of writing is just so reflective of the way that the human mind works. It is so realistic in the way that Christopher Banks is telling us his story. He will start us off on one tangent, remember something from that one tangent, and then take us to another. Sometimes there is no linking up again. Sometimes there is, and it forms this perfect circle of memory. Sometimes we can like literally see him retelling his own memories and rewriting his own conscious thoughts and things that he has stored in the archive of the human mind that is now being incorrectly labeled, incorrectly filed, and incorrectly remembered. There are a lot of different kinds of memory, um, memories, memories that can change and memories that cannot change, um, but Ishiguro is primarily concerned, I believe, with just the way we remember memory as a living, breathing, evolving thing. We try to take advantage of our memories, we try to control them, we try to weave them into some sort of narrative, and that is Christopher's main problem in this book, is trying to fit his memories into this nicely told story, which is part of the reason he's telling us his story, but um, that is a trap all in and of itself because that leads him to so many complications, so many glossing over of facts, rewriting of facts, because that is one of the most sad parts of the story, is just reading it and like seeing what he thinks and um, his childhood trauma, obviously. We're introduced to a number of different characters, all of whom are also orphans, whether their parents have died or gone missing or they're just not there, per se. This book takes you on such a wild, crazy ride. Eventually, Christopher goes back over to Shanghai after he has met this beautiful woman that he's kind of started to form a relationship with um, and he goes back to Shanghai to finally solve the mystery of his parents missing this. Um, this book is so sad, so sad. I'm not gonna say anything else because this is a book that you just need to go into and read and have that experience because it was remarkable, so sad, so crushing, and I just love, 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 love the tropes and the techniques and the absolute just mastery of writing that Is Your Girl uses, especially like I said at the beginning, this book starts off so quietly, so quaintly, with such like this very um, I don't know what to call it, this very, like, secure atmosphere. The reader feels very secure, very lulled, very comforted, very assured, and then eventually that breaks down so catastrophically. It's like a radioactive decay just throughout this whole book, and whew, so good. Sorry, I see, this is what I mean. I'll just start, like, talking about a book, and then we'll be here all day, so... Let's move on. This was amazing. Another book that I gave five stars to this month, which will kind of close off our five star reads and four and a half star reads, I think, is Stories of God by Rilke. This is a collection of 13 short stories that he wrote when he was 23 after recently going on this huge trip to Russia. Um, so these stories are all kind of inspired by Russia, inspired by the spirituality that he witnessed there and with his friends and everything like that. Rilke has a very, very distinct, particular um, relationship and experience and description and um, invention of God that is so, 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 so illuminating, so broadening, so expansive. Um, he breaks out of every single tradition ever. It's so refreshing, so freeing. Um, spirituality is something that is so key in all of his works, but it's never something that is bogged down by religion. Rilke's Rilke's God is not one that is found in religion at all, which I absolutely just, I love that. Um, each of these stories is so, so sweet and so filled with his prose that is so charming um, and so nice. And the way that he deals with like, I don't know, I, I, don't, I feel like I almost just called it Twilight, but this very in-between ever-changing, like you can look away and then suddenly something's not there that was there before. It's not really magical realism. I kind of tried to talk about this before, but whenever I try to talk about the somethingness, 
somethingness in Rilke. Um, it's very difficult because it's not something that can be pinned down. It's not something that you can say, oh, that's magical realism. This isn't something that's real. Because for him, it is. It's spirituality. It's his experience. It's something that is very much real. But that can definitely be seen as a little bit fantastical or just in his writing, making it fantastical, making these everyday encounters with women and people and children. These short stories are directed towards children because Rilke was very, very, very fond of children. He thought they're the most important people on the planet. I think I'm talking really fast. Um, and he was so embarrassed to talk to them that he thought it would be better if he wrote short stories to give them um, because he was too shy to do it himself. So. These stories are just, I don't know, I just find so much comfort in them. They're so wholesome, they're so beautiful, um, and they're just really, really, really nice things to read. So I gave it five stars. I was kind of hesitant what I would think of Stories of God because I don't give all of Rilke's work five stars, but um, yeah, so that is that one. Okay, we're now going to move into the three, did I read three young adult books? Maybe. Anyway, I read the first two books of the Truly Devious series by Maureen Johnson, Truly Devious and The Vanishing Stair. I really, really like these. I gave them both three and a half stars, which is really, really good because you guys know I'm very, I'm just so stingy about young adult. I don't know why, just a thing. But <laughs> these books are really, really good, honestly. And um, I've seen so many people loving them recently on booktube and otherwise, so I would really recommend. They they could be loosely loosely called dark academia simply because they're set at a very prestigious school and dark terrible things happen. Murder happen. Murder is just everywhere. We're following Stephanie Bell who goes by the name of Stevie. She is a true crime fan. She has read all the books, Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes, um, all the podcasts, literally everything like that. That is her thing. So she gets admitted to this very pretentious, prestigious cool school called Ellingham Academy. I believe we're in Vermont. Um, the atmosphere in here is just... yes. But she gets admitted because the founder of the school, Albert Ellingham, his wife and his daughter were kidnapped um, and eventually assumed to have been murdered because they've never been found and it is still a mystery. So this book jumps back and forth. It's a non-linear narrative, which love, love. All the love. Jumps back and forth between the 1930s? I think it's the 1930s, um, and obviously present day. We have a very, very, very interesting cast of characters in modern day. We have Stevie, our true crime junkie. We have our friend Nate, who's actually my favorite character. He's a fantasy author. We have a YouTube sensation star. We have an engineering goddess. We have this French art scene girl who just quotes Baudelaire all the time, which is great. Um, and we just have so many other amazing characters. So this book jumps back and forth between those two narratives, trying to figure out what's going on in the past and what's going on in the present. Um, like I said, really, really love them. When I was younger, I was a huge fan of Maureen Johnson's other series, The Name of the Star. Um, I think the the series is actually called Shades of London, regardless. That one's about Jack the Ripper and ghosts. Really awesome. Um, and I was also very impressed with the series. That is truly devious. My favorite young adult book of the month, this is probably like my fourth favorite book of the month, is Gemina by Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. Um, this is Oh, is this my favorite young adult series? It's definitely my favorite, like, young adult sci-fi series, but this is the second book in the Illuminae Files. I ended up liking this one better than Illuminae, and this one we are actually on Jump Station Heimdall, which is where our kind of lonely voyaging um, space ship in the first book is trying to get to after their planet and their other ships have been destroyed by Baytech, the very evil capitalist company that everyone's trying to take down. This one I just loved because, oh, the characters, I just loved the characters so much more. First of all, Nick and Hannah and Ella and Jackson and just, just everyone on here was so awesome. It was literally just die hard in space, uh, like I said, but um, that was honestly fine. I love that. There was so much playing around with like very strange quantum mechanics and that was like amazing. I loved it. There's these very, very strange, scary space creatures. Insane. Loved it. Our favorite rogue AI is back in town. Um, and once again, I just cannot say anything but glittering, glistening, shining things about the audiobook production of this book. You have to read this book um, alongside the audiobook production of it because it is just absolutely an insane, amazing experience to have. Um, this book is all told in multimedia format, and um, yeah, 
<laughs> I just really, really loved it. Also, I'm not going to spoil anything, but a whole sky full of different stars. That part just really got me. It got me. It got me good. So yeah, I cannot wait to read the last one, but at the same time I don't want to read it because I don't want it to be over. But that is Gemini. Absolutely adored this. Okay, now we're going to move into our non-fiction section because I read a lot of non-fiction this month, actually, um, and I'm still currently reading a lot of non-fiction, but um, that I didn't manage to finish up before the month ended. So I'll talk about non-fiction for a little bit and then we'll move into our sci-fi books to close off the month, even though that was sci-fi as well. Anyway, the first non-fiction book I read in May was 1491 New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus by Charles C. Mann. So this is an extremely well-written, engaging, informative, educational uh, non-fiction book operating on three assumptions in the Americas before Columbus got there and did all the nasty bad things that Columbus did. So number one, that the indigenous groups and tribes and peoples who populated these lands arrived at these lands in the Americas, Mesoamerica, South America, far earlier than was originally supposed. Number two, that the populations of these indigenous groups were so monumentally larger than was originally presumed. And finally, number three, um, it talks about ecology and basically how the Amazon rainforest is now thought to have started as a garden that was intentionally pruned, burned, harvested, forested, taken care of, um, but essentially created by these groups uh, for their survival and for their benefit, basically. This was really, really well done. It comes with so many maps and graphs and more readings at the back if you'd like to check out or fact check or just do some more research yourself. It was very informative. Um, so many crazy things are finally put into one book because one of the author's main motivations for writing this book was because no one was saying these things. There was all this research that was not being compiled, some of it that was not obviously being done in the first place, um, and the author really wanted to read a book that would explain the Americas before Columbus's arrival and before all the things that Columbus did, so he put it together himself. There's also a sequel called 1493, which is obviously what happens after Columbus gets here, which would be insane to probably read after this, obviously. This next nonfiction book that I read definitely competes with probably the top place for my favorite nonfiction of the month. That book is God, A Human History by Reza Aslan. This, yeah, this was really, 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 really good. Right off the bat, I do want to say that even though it's called God, it's not really about God. It's about religion and about Hugh you and about how human beings have gone about creating religion, religion as a man-made thing. This book is such a good tour of religion. Um, also starts in the Neolithic period and basically introduces the idea of the religious impulse neurologically in our minds, why we are evolutionarily adapted to create religion um, and to think these things and especially concerned, at least at the beginning of this book, of why we humanize deities, why we humanize gods, why we worship things that are more often than not in the human form, in our form. It may seem like a pretty obvious thing, but it goes so much deeper than you think it will. Um, um, and just the insane mechanisms that it explains and kind of the genetic traits and the genetic events that take place um, through the survival of homo sapiens to get to religion. Um, it blew my mind. I think one of the coolest things too is that it implicates and identifies religion as the catalyst for the Neolithic revolution. Uh, or farming, which is insane. From there, this book details basically a lot of the first religions. It deconstructs Genesis, it deconstructs the Bible, um, it basically kind of blows apart all of your perceptions and all of your previously attained notions or ideals about um, <laughs> kind of what the Bible is and how it came into being. And I think this book, honestly, anyone should read this, regardless if you consider yourself someone who is a religious person or who isn't, or if you have read the Bible, if you haven't read the Bible, this is so valuable, so much good information in here. And more than that, it is just so phenomenally interesting. Uh, it goes over a lot of religions. It goes over monotheism, pantheism, um, and just the way that human beings have kind of cultured and created ourselves as religious beings. Um, um, and why we've created this thing. Yeah, I was just, I really, 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 really like this book. Um, both 1491 and God are very engaging, very easy to read, very 
user-friendly nonfiction books. Um, but that's always an important aspect of nonfiction is keeping your reader interested because a lot of time people um, are cautious and people are hesitant or scared about reading nonfiction because they believe it to be boring or not presented in an engaging matter. And of course it's important to present all the facts and all the information, but you can have a really great writing style, you can engage your reader, you can um, do it in a way that will inspire people to keep reading. Um, and a human history, really, 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 really super awesome. Um, it's like number it's one of my number one favorite nonfiction books now. So this was also a cool place to start because then I started reading all of these other nonfiction books, kind of related, not really along the same vein. I was kind of reading them in tangent, which was cool, but they really kind of wove together and were really nice compliments to each other. I read three books by the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh this month. I've also heard it pronounced Thich Nhat Hanh, so I don't know. This was also incredible and I just want to, I haven't finished the nonfiction book that kind of ties in with Thich Nhat Hanh's works that I've been reading, but it was really cool because it wasn't intentional, they just kind of both came up um, in my Libby library at the same time. So I read The Art of Mindful Living, Pieces of Every Breath, and The Miracle of Mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh. But at the same time, The Vietnam War by Jeffrey C. Ward came in and that's what I'm currently listening to, currently halfway through, it's a 30 hour long audiobook. But it's so cool because obviously Thich Nhat Hanh is Vietnamese, he was very very opposed to the war, and then that book mentioned him and then he mentioned the Vietnam War and it was this very like cool. I don't know, I just love when like you're reading a whole bunch of books and they all interact with each other because that's what it's about. It's just about this voice that even though there's so many different authors, it's it's always this voice. Um and this, this oneness that God A Human History talked about, Thich Nhat Hanh talked about, the Vietnam War talking about Thich Nhat Hanh talked about. Um, very, very cool experience. Anyway, let's just talk about Thich Nhat Hanh because I loved his works. Um, the first one I read was called The Art of Mindful Living. This is an audiobook recording of his voice, which I... His voice is so beautiful. Um, of a retreat he gave in the States to an audience about basically breathing techniques and peaceful techniques. Really, really, really highly recommend. The Art of Mindful Living goes over a lot of exercises. Um, he's so funny. He's so... He's so inspirational. Um, and then Pieces Every Breath was kind of a reiteration of that, like I said in one of my vlogs, but um, I think that one's super valuable too because it goes a little bit more in depth, explains a little bit more, um, and it's just amazing. My favorite was The Miracle of Mindfulness which he wrote very early on. It wasn't meant to be a book, it was a letter. Eventually they started printing copies of it and giving it to lots of people, especially people who were involved in the Vietnam War. The Miracle of Mindfulness also comes with this nice little backstory and back history and back information. I've put the rest of his books I could find on Libby on hold because he's written over 70 works, but um, I would love to read them all because Super awesome. Highly recommend. Okay, so I have three more books I want to talk about. I guess moving out of nonfiction now and into kind of sci-fi, whatever. The first one is Carrie by Stephen King. This is the book I would like to focus the least bit upon because um, the guy hmm, wasn't good. I had never read a Stephen King novel previously in my life. I don't really know what compelled me to pick up Carrie. I think because I read the synopsis. Oh, like I knew what Carrie was about because everyone probably knows what Carrie's about, but it sounded very disturbing, very spooky. This is a story about a girl who is bullied extremely, who is raised by this extremely religious mother and just the way that she is hideously treated by her peers and by literally everyone in her life. Until finally, because of all this pressure that's been compounded and put upon her, she explodes with like this telekinetic power um, that she doesn't really know what, what it is, what's happening. I did not like this book for a lot, a lot of reasons, so let's talk about them. Number one, it was just a bad book. Wasn't well written, wasn't well delivered, wasn't well performed. There were a lot of problematic aspects about this book as well. The way it was written, what was written in this book, what it said about a variety of minorities, what it said about women, what it said about political systems, what it said about literally just everything. And obviously people can interpret that and be like, well, Stephen King is just doing this and this and this. Yes, to an extent, but there's never an excuse to use language that you do not need to use and that you should not use above all. One positive thing I can say about this book was that it held a little bit of power because it was very uncomfortable. At least for me, I found it very upsetting to read, um, especially the parts about Carrie and the way that she was treated, obviously, by girls at her high school, the way that she was bullied, how she was bullied, like he just brutally 
um, put it down into words and that was like very difficult to read. You feel this very strange mixture all the time about Carrie, kind of balancing between pity and revulsion, which is a very strong, very compelling um, dichotomy to have and to have presented to you and as a reader to be very squeamish about that, which can be turned into this very valuable thing. If you can kind of examine that and then seesaw to one side of that seesaw. So that was cool and that was powerful. But on the whole, Carrie by Stephen King was just not, um, I just can't objectively say it was a good book. I don't know if I'll ever read, oh, maybe I'll read, I'll try something else of his works, but it's not like, it's like literally at the bottom of books that I'm concerned about or that I have any desire to um, branch out about or read because I was just very uh, disappointed with this book. So that was Carrie. The next sci-fi I read was so much better than Carrie and that was Waking Gods by Sylvain Nouvelle. This is the sequel to Sleeping Giants which I read back in April. I think I read it back in April. This is really great. Basically, this whole book is sold in interview format, which is cool. Um, in Sleeping Giants, there is this huge metal robot hand discovered in the ground, and then eventually um, this organization and these people and these scientists and these people <laughs> find a whole bunch of other parts and they think that there's like a sleeping giant in the ground. Waking Gods deals with what happens ten years later. Um, after all the crazy stuff that happened in Sleeping Giants happens. In Waking Gods, we find out that Earth might have some visitors, uh, and that they do have some visitors, but we don't really know how to handle them. This book, this sci-fi, is like very cool. It offers definitely a little bit of commentary on humans and our place in the universe, which is so cool, so interesting, uh, especially in relation to like in relation to what this book, I don't want to spoil it, in relation to what this book talks about and in relation to what it's having a relationship with guys. <laughs> um, I gave it three and a half stars. I definitely like the direction that this book took. Um, so happy to see like our cast of characters back. I just love Vincent. He's just great. Yeah, so the way that this book ended has just insanely made me want to finish the series, get on with the last book called Only Humans because the way that Waking Gods ended Sometimes it did fall a little flat, sometimes it wasn't as interesting because there's not this myriad of things going on, it's kind of just this one crazy thing. But yes, that is Waking Gods. And finally, the last book that I read in the month of May, I think. <laughs> um, it is a young adult sci-fi. <laughs> this isn't embarrassing, but um, I very, very much enjoy and honestly find just pure entertainment in Star Wars and especially in Star Wars stories. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. All those stories written by uh, a host of authors, different authors that come out about Star Wars um, that are kind of spin-offs or little novellas or adventures. Anyway, this one's called Force Collector by Kevin Shinnick. Um, I really liked it. It was so charming. Um, <laughs> This is set right before The Force Awakens, and we're following this young boy named Carr, um, and he gets these intense headaches and the whole, you know, slew of symptoms, and his parents make him see all these doctors thinking that he has some malignant disease. Um, meanwhile, his grandmother is very just convinced that he has the Force, because obviously when he touches things, he can see the memory um, surrounded by those objects and what those objects experience. So he goes on this quest with a girl from his school and they basically they steal a spaceship and then they fly around the galaxy uh, in order to find objects that he can touch and tell him what happened to the Jedi <laughs> because no one knows what happened to the Jedi they think they're all dead obviously um, but it was just really really sweet the audiobook production of this was so amazing it can't it comes with music it comes with sound effects, very cool sound effects. Um, they play like the Star Wars score, and it was really great. Honestly, it made me smile. Very entertaining, pure escapism, and um, I would really recommend. <laughs> if you think you don't like Star Wars, maybe you would like Star Wars, um, because this was really cute. So yes, those are all of the books I read in May. Oh, I gave Force Collector three stars, sorry. But those were the books I read in May. Um, I'm very excited for June because it is obviously now the Meet Your Myth Taker readathon, uh, which I am participating in, and I'll probably talk about my TBR. Um, I think maybe in my next vlog or something. But um, thank you guys so much for watching. If you've read any of these books, 
Let's talk about them. Um, tell me what you're reading right now. Tell me your favorite book of May. Um, I just want to talk to you guys in the comments because um, you all mean so much to me and I hope you're sincerely doing well. So yeah, my camera is about to die and my brain is about to have a meltdown. So <laughs> um, I will see you very soon in the next video. Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and yeah, je vais vous voir dans la prochaine vidéo. Ciao.